All right, welcome back for another chess analysis game. We're going to be looking over Bobby Fischer's match against uh, Robert Byrne. And at the time, Robert Byrne was an international master, but a year later became a grandmaster. Um, but at the time, again, he was, play he was playing as an IM against the young Bobby Fischer, and Bobby Fischer was playing as black. So I'm excited to see how Bobby ends up winning this game in tw just 21 moves against a very, very, very strong player. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. All right, Robert Byrne starts with the Queen's Pawn opening. We're gonna... Bobby chooses Knight F6, C4, G6, pretty normal stuff. G3, both so both sides are fianchettoing their bishops. All right, so before Bobby just chooses to jump into Bishop G7, which um, was the first thing that sticks out to me because honestly, one of my automatic like choices when I play G6, I play Bishop G7. It's kind of right away. Um, but the point he's making here with C6 is that he's trying to occupy the center right away so that White doesn't get an overwhelming center himself. Um, so like like I said, we normally expect Bishop G7, um, but he's first occupying with C6 with the idea of playing um, D5 here and preventing anything from hitting on E4. Right now it can't be um, played, but if White wanted to, if we went back a move, say we played Bishop, Bishop G7, Bishop G2, castles, and you could go into Knight C3, C6, and E4. And now we have this really strong center by white. And he probably could have played e4 earlier. Let me take a look. Yeah, so he could, he could play e4 here. Um, but personally, I would rather develop the minor piece before pushing too many pawns. Um, that's just kind of a personal taste of mine because I'm afraid of overextending my pawn reach and causing some weaknesses before then. Okay. So but his choice was c6. And All right, so let's go back c6, bishop g2, d5, take, take. All right, normal development here, castles, right, knight protects knight, castles. And as you can see here, um, both uh, Fisher and Burn kind of have a lot of symmetry going on. So we both, they both have played um, Fianchettoing on the, well, we're preparing to Fianchettoing on both sides, really. And they both developed their knights, they both developed a bishop here. So a lot of it looks the same, except that we can notice here that we have one knight on f6, and instead of being on f3 for white, he has played to knight to e2. So there are subtle differences to take note of. As an intermediate player myself, um, I don't know how significant it is for me to be paying attention to something like that, because being able to exploit that difference would be challenging for me at this level. Um, but something to keep in mind, being able to notice the differences and kind of how it impacts the other pieces as well. Um, so this is also noteworthy to me to play this b6 move um, because oftentimes in, I found myself in positions similar to this one and I wonder, okay, what do you do with the dark square bishop? Um, and often I'll play either to g, g4 or to f5 here. And I don't think anything's wrong with f5. I think there's probably an issue with... Um, Let's see, if, if I were to play um, bishop g4, he could be kicked away, gain a tempo, and I end up just moving again. I'm probably not going to move here now. I end up moving back here, um, which is blocking my queen. So there's some issues there. Um, the best move probably is um, bishop f5, um, where he can't be attacked right away. But again, there's an opportunity um, down the line where he can kick my bishop. It's just something to think about. It's probably um, a good continuation for it. But I like um, expanding my ideas by watching this game, and I can see that there's another idea playing to bishop a6, um, kind of hitting the other side of the board entirely in this other diagonal. Also pinning this knight down to the rook, so putting some pressure on um, uh, the white's pieces. White chooses to do the same, so we're playing a very symmetrical game with the exception of this knight here. And also doing the same thing to us, pinning the pawn down to this rook, just like we are pinning the knight down to this rook. Um, I should also note that the pawn here is up one square, where our pawn has not moved. All right. So Fisher moves his rook over, getting out of the pin, and also preparing for e5. Queen moves up. Now the white pieces have completely developed. 
bishop, knight, knight, bishop all developed, and the rooks are now connected, the king's um, castled, queen has moved, development is complete. Fisher goes ahead and plays to e5, he takes, takes. Now, at first glance here, I'm looking um, and I'm seeing that it looks like this pawn is attacked three times and we're only defending it twice. Um, but to my understanding here, when, through the analysis tool, um, is that it's actually not free. So let's say, um, let's say knight take d5. Knight take d5, bishop take d5. And now you got this fork, which is automatically losing four white. And if it was played differently, let's say, oh, actually I should mention too, um, bishop can't come back and take um, because now this queen is left unprotected. So that would just take some calculation. At first glance, it looks like, okay, yeah, it's not protected, but in actuality, we're paying attention that there's some weakness in the position, that this queen is not yet protected. Um, there's potential fork here that's only blocked by the bishop, and if the bishop's overworked, there's going to be some issues there. So that's something to keep in mind. So the pawn's actually safe here. And now this, this um, I'm about to say this interesting, uh, this move was really interesting to me too because like I didn't think to just jump there. I'm like, what's the purpose? But having the knight here is it's significant where I, I might not be able to see right away okay what the continuation is. But while it's not the center, the the knight has a lot of squares. It's controlling here, 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 and here, and here. Um, so all these dark squares are controlled by the knight, and it it can't be a, attested to right now. The queen's not going to take and sacrifice itself for a knight and bishop. Um, so it was a nice place to sit, um, and I'm sure that Bob Fisher had a, more of a plan than I did. Queen moves out the way, and this is something that I want to get to the point where I can really try to understand, like, how do you get to the point where you make a sacrifice like that? This is another game where it's like, when I'm playing casual chess, um, or if, even if I was playing in a tournament, if it was like 30 minutes or less, I probably wouldn't even look at taking F2. But I'm trying to get to that mindset, and we all should get to this mindset where we look at all the captures, all the attacks um, in, in any given position. We're kind of scanning them and checks. Uh, in case this case, there's no checks. But what does this capture really do? And what's happening right now where I can, where it can be more on my radar in the future to look for moves like this? And what I've come to notice is that um, this pawn, for one, is only protected by another pawn, keeping that in mind. Uh, if, if I imagine for a second that my knight would jump here to here, it would be forking this rook and the queen. That's something to keep in mind. So if anything ever happened to this pawn, potentially I can meet that fork and also recognize that this rook is here too to back up the knight. So just with that being said, just noticing that little piece, I might be more open to making this sacrifice. Of course, I would have to do some calculation to be more sure that that's something worth doing. Um, but just noticing that those um, weaknesses in the position or just the nature of the position would lead me to make, make that choice, be more likely to make that choice. So he plays it. King takes back. And knight comes in and does give that check. And like I mentioned before, is attacking on, what's that, e3. Now this alone wouldn't be enough. Um, he had something deeper in mind. But if we take a look here, and the queen moves out the way, obviously you're going to save the queen, otherwise the, the game is simply over. Um, there's two options here, of course. You can either take the bishop or take the rook. Now, the natural inclination is to jump and take the rook, get your piece material back. Um, but if we do that, um, we're pretty much just going into uh, an equal position. And it's like, okay, why? why? We gotta be have more purpose to our moves, like instead of just getting an equal position. And now it, it's um, the computer says slightly better for white, but as humans, it's still um, difficult to play because we have this isolated pawn that we have to take care of and pr protect perfectly. Um, and our initiative is now gone. So the deeper move that um, Fisher came up with was actually, let's see, let's go back to, all right, so to take on G2 instead of taking the rook back. So at this point you're saying, I'm looking for mate. Um, I'm going to be down material, but in exchange, the king is exposed. He's lost his best protector, uh, his best defender, which was the white squared bishop. 
Now this white squared, light squared bishop that we have is not going to be attested by another bishop. So that's something to notice in the position that now that the light squared bishop is gone, our bishop is that much stronger. Okay, and these light squares become that much weaker now that his bishop's gone. So that bishop in actuality is worth more than it normally would have been. And then the next move is played was d4, which has to be played right now. And the reason being is because if you want to activate this bishop and put it on this ideal diagonal, not only to check the king, but also to cut off all these squares for his escape and become more powerful yourself, is because if you don't play it now, let me make an adjustment here. If you don't play e5 now and you play bishop b7 instead, white has the opportunity to block you with this knight here. And if you take back with the bishop, it's still going to be the queen blocking this pawn. And as we know, pawns can't take pieces going forward. So it's just, you're just stuck there, and the bishop can't move, can't do what it needs to. And it, according to the computer here, white is about a point and a half better. And as it thinks, maybe a little bit less, but still, it, your sacrifice became uh, irrelevant at this point. So you have to play accurately. And what ended up being done was playing d4, so that the bishop always has his opportunity to come out. Knight takes d4, bishop b7, as planned. Okay, so yes, a piece was sacrificed, but notice that the shape of the king and the light squares are very weak, with no bishop to a contest. So now it's a little bit more apparent than before. And jumping onto the light squares is the queen moving up one, threatening to come into light squares here or here. And th this is actually where um, Robert Byrne had resigned, seeing what was going to happen next, and that he was at quite a disadvantage. If you look at the bar on the right, the computer is definitely agreeing that black is significantly better. But just to show uh, one example of um, an end game here, let's say, let's just say uh, Bishop um, Knight, to e Knight C to E2. There's really no good moves here. And Queen check, King over. There's no real good option. Had he gone here, this would be checkmate with the bishop guarding the queen. Queen steps in. This is actually threatening mate here. Knight can't go back because it's pinned down to the rook. We got the king stuck in the center. All his pieces are not coordinating well. We got the bishop slicing through the middle of the middle of the board, controlling so many squares, and it's really just inevitable at this point. Uh, doesn't matter where the queen moves. Um, and this, this, the reason behind this move would be the give an escape square for the king. Um, bishop takes, and there's really, there's really nothing left to do. Um, we're threatening mate here, and we're threatening to take another piece. Um, yeah, it's, this is just game over for, for white. So that's it for this game. Um, the, that sacrifice is really what I was just trying to pay attention to, kind of get an understanding of the position outside of just trading pieces and material differences alone. Um, understanding that the value of pieces can change based on where they're positioned. Like this bishop here is more valuable than this rook in that position um, because it's the only thing protecting the king and it's the only thing guarding the light squares. And it makes our bishop more powerful. So that was my big takeaway um, from this game. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Please like and subscribe and what have you. Um, and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks.